Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome to another episode on the New Books Network. I'm one of your hosts, Dr. Miranda Melcher, and I'm very pleased today to be speaking with Dr. Ruth Morgan about her book titled Climate Change and International History, Negotiating Science, Global Change and Environmental Justice, just published in 2024 from Bloomsbury. Um, This is a really interesting book I found and also a really important book because it examines how climate change has been debated, discussed, configured in the international arena all the way back from the 1950s, very much up until today. And um, given how much climate change is still part of international debates, I think this is a pretty important bit of history to be aware of. So Ruth, thank you so much for coming onto the podcast to tell us about it. My pleasure. Thank you so much for having me, Miranda. Could you start us off, please, by introducing yourself a little bit and explain why you decided to write this book? Sure. That's that's a very good place to start, as you say. I'm approaching this book as an environmental historian and a historian of science, so perhaps not um, necessarily the first kind of expertise you might think of when um, tackling these issues, especially from this um, position of international history. I've previously worked on histories of climate and water, mainly in the Australian context and also in a comparative sense, um, often putting the Australian experience into connection and comparison, say, with the American West or parts of the British Empire. And my first book was on how settler Australians have understood and adapted to the particular climate conditions of the southern half of the continent. And then how a changing climate with reduced rainfall has influenced, I suppose, the ways that settler Australians in particular have uh, used resources and and tried to establish um, a particular way of life. So in some ways I I sort of see this this book that I'm um, discussing with you today as something of an extension or um, uh, an offshoot of that work to understand how that local story or it was felt local to me, um, fits into this much bigger international story. And I've also worked um, on the recent IPCC's sixth assessment report in Working Group 2. So I had some broad familiarity with the institutions of governing climate change. And of course, I'm aware of the frustrations of many about the pace of climate action and how that is perceived often to be um, too slow in light of the accelerating changes that we're seeing. So I felt that it was um, important for for us to um, have a, well, for myself, I guess, um, quite selfishly, to to try to understand how climate change and climate more generally has come to be understood in the way that um, we do now, that has become this sort of uh, subject of international governance and that it's not just a handful of countries that have a role in its government. It's, It's all countries. And that makes for, I suppose, the challenges I think that um, we've faced, but it's also quite important, I think, um, to to explore what kind of dynamics come through with that particular arrangement. And it's important, I think, to recognise how uh, current understandings of climate change weren't inevitable. They are a particular um, outcome of a whole series of um historical events, I suppose. Um, And I'm curious to, I suppose, flesh out the implications of, of that, um, of that history. Mm. What a great kind of introduction, I think, to the book. So many things there that we're going to talk more about. So thank you for starting us off with that. Um, I'd like to kind of pick up that last point first, the idea that it's not inevitable that we ended up where we are now, because in fact, uh, if we go back to the sort of beginning chronologically of the period you cover, you actually talk about there was quite a bit of optimism in terms of global coordination and the weather right after World War II, which definitely I read going, global optimism about the weather? Hmm, okay, that sounds different from today. So can you tell us what was going on um, at this point and sort of help us understand kind of when and how and with what impact this initial positive feeling starts to fade? Yes, I was really struck by the the contrast as well and the the great optimism um, that followed the Second World War. And when, when we know that 
obviously the Second World War ended with with such um, devastation when we're thinking about the the effects of um, the atomic bombs on Japan. Um, and yet at the same time, there is a, a collection of very internationally minded scientists and policymakers and intellectuals, I suppose, who are really keen to see what what is emerging as one world thinking, um, to see that actually being realised as a way really to avoid further devastation, to, to avoid further uh, catastrophe. Um, they wanted international institutions, obviously the United Nations is is one product of this um, way of thinking, but they, they felt very strongly that these kinds of global institutions would be a way to avoid such um, devastation unfolding again. So to really bring about this kind of um, one worldism um, beyond its uh, sort of a, a vision or an imaginary. It was a it was a real project. And I've mentioned the United Nations, but the agencies that came out of this um, this moment included the World Meteorological Organization, which is a subset um, of of the United Nations. And there was a sense that, well, meteorology naturally lent itself to this kind of outlook because, of course, the atmosphere doesn't respect geopolitical borders. And that was something that had become very clear during the war as well, that uh, that th- that fighting the war required a, a very strong knowledge of atmospheric changes about meteorological conditions. So in some ways, the, the war had primed scientists and governments to, to think about how meteorology um, could be better coordinated, could be a shared and unified effort. So this is where some of that optimism is coming from. There's also what I found uh, surprising was an optimism emerging specifically from uh, the atomic bombs that, in fact, putting aside, obviously, the the enormous human impact, that this could herald a means of weather control. And there was great hope there that humans could finally uh, overcome this, I suppose, limit on on their development. I mean, this was a very um, hopeful uh, way of thinking. But with with a greater recognition of what was at stake as rivalries started to emerge after the end of the war and uh, Cold War tensions started to to develop, that atomic weapons and uh, the the science and the knowledge behind that was actually going to um, really define the coming era and be a source of tension rather than um, the means of... um, uh, bringing humanity together would actually be part of of keeping um, a, that fierce rivalry and tension alive. So as, as uh, d- more countries beyond the United States started to develop their own um, testing regimes, that's when we start to see that kind of um, fading optimism, that instead um, having the power of weather control might actually fall into the wrong hands. And that really becomes something that um, influences the way that the ways that scientists and their governments begin to think about what's at stake when uh, they are investigating the weather. Hmm. The way you tell it, it sounds like a very sort of straightforward transition, <laughs> but I think that's more to do with your ability to make all this make sense, um, because that really is quite a big shift. Um, and I think also useful for that reminder that kind of, in some senses, we might think about climate politics as being sort of its own sphere of debate. And yet, no, the Cold War is a huge part of this, right? It's not something we can just kind of magically separate out. Absolutely. I think this is the um, one of the aspects that I suppose uh, I kept coming back to with almost a degree of frustration of how um, so often I think when we do talk about climate politics, it's um, presented as somehow separate from everything else, as though it is a distinct form of um, environmental change that is somehow separated from uh, energy systems, from geopolitics, from questions of development. And and yet writing this history, I 
I kept finding it had to keep growing to encapsulate the roots of in fact, all the processes that are feeding into this current moment that we're experiencing. So that rather than being a a story strictly of, shall we say, scientific discovery and political um, cooperation, um, albeit with, um, of course, many hiccups along the way, it's actually... I, I realised it was a story about development, about the Cold War, about competition, about different visions of the future and and how, I suppose, countries sought to establish the, the post-war order and then how that was remade again at the end of the Cold War. Hmm. I want to add another aspect to these um, political discussions, uh, given what you've just helpfully kind of made sure that we link throughout this. I want to add in another piece of science, uh, if we can, to these debates, you know, just to make it more complicated. (laughs) You've been talking so far about the weather, right? And we've got the idea of nuclear weapons, of the Cold War. When and how and why does carbon dioxide come into these discussions, both on the sort of, quote, pure science side, but also in terms of these international political debates? (laughs) This is a this is a funny question, I think, because um, again, when we uh, look at, I suppose, uh, perhaps timelines of our understandings of the climate and climate change, we become quickly aware that the link scientifically or physically, I should say, between uh, rising levels of carbon dioxide and rising global temperatures had actually been theorised in the mid-19th century, uh, both in the United States and in Great Britain. And that can lead people to assume, well, we've known about this problem for well over 100 years and we've done nothing about it. But what's important to recognise is that that was just one of many theories and, in fact, one that wasn't necessarily mainstream until quite late in the piece, really, um, not until after the Second World War. Um, and that's that's quite surprising, I think. And what's also important to recognise is that when there was subsequent iterations of, of the connection between carbon dioxide and a warming climate at the turn of the 20th century, this was indeed welcomed by scientists who were working in Northern Europe because they thought, well, it's awfully cold here. Uh, we have problems of not being able to grow enough crops because of the the climate conditions. They were welcoming these warmer conditions and they hoped that burning coal would warm the climate for them. So they were, in fact, quite optimistic about the results of this theory. But again, at this stage, it was not the mainstream and there were all sorts of other ideas about what might um, be affecting um, the the climate patterns they're observing. And they were observing changes in um, sea ice and changes in uh, climate conditions, particularly in the Northern Hemisphere. And they were trying to, during the 1930s, 40s and 50s, trying to work out, well, what was the cause of those changes? And when there is again another... Um, suggestion that for perhaps carbon dioxide and as a result of industrialization might have something to do with these changes they were dismissed they were they were not accepted as um as the cause so it's not really until the 50s and 60s partly as a result of um nuclear tests partly as a result of uh, the the measurement of uh, changing levels of carbon dioxide through international scientific cooperation, they start to acknowledge that, in fact, the levels of carbon dioxide are increasing and there is something to this theory that actually this could well warm the planet. So as much as we've known perhaps the theory at a a sort of... uh, um, very theoretical uh, sense, I guess. Um, it's not really until we're right into the, to the thick of the Cold War that, and becoming concerned about air pollution at more at local scales, that the prospect of a human impact on on the climate is actually um, begun to be to be recognised and understood. Hmm. I definitely was surprised um, to read that section because it's so kind of embedded now to think about carbon dioxide that it was really interesting to kind of see 
that that wasn't necessarily what I had thought and kind of how it did become such a key part of the discourse. Um, so in this kind of vein, I suppose, of setting the terms of the debate and coming up with, I think, a lot of the framing we still very much have, adding on to what you've told us about climate change, uh, sorry, not climate change, carbon dioxide, um, can you talk us through Stockholm 1972? Absolutely. It's this, this is a kind of foundational moment in international environmental governance, um, for want of a better term. We have a concern at the internet, at the highest level, at the international um, level for states to come together to discuss uh, shared environmental problems. And very quickly, um, the meeting kind of descended into the, the struggles that continue to dominate um, international environmental politics well into the 90s, if not longer. And these were issues that quite understandably uh, centred on questions of development and, and the use of resources. And the, the framing of these international environmental issues was very quickly perceived by the major governments of what was the, the developing world, the global south, if you like. They, they approached these issues that the, uh, the developed countries, the industrialised countries, were presented with great suspicion because countries like India, countries um, like China and Brazil perceived the the agenda that was emerging as having grave consequences for the development of their own peoples. They, they were incredibly concerned with what it would mean for them if they were to have limits on the resources that they could extro exploit or extract within their own borders. So the, the environmental politics um, that the the global north was presenting at the time was was seen as a, a real threat to to their development they saw this as a way for the north to halt their own to halt their development to basically um, stall uh, the the trajectory that these countries saw themselves on of of uplifting their populations from poverty of as so their leaders put it and they argued that well the north had created these problems so why should they be um uh putting any kind of um barriers to the to the continued growth of the developing world so it was very clear um at at stockholm in 1972 that these discussions were not going to be um, straightforward, um, that they were going to um, be very much centred almost not on the, on the environment per se, but on questions of development and how, how countries could manage their, their growth sustainably. I mean, we didn't have quite the sustainability discourse that emerges in the late, late 1980s at this point, but the seeds are being sown here. And it took some convincing for uh, economists and thinkers um, to really explain how, in fact, development could potentially be pursued in ways that were sustainable, that weren't going to necessarily come at the cost of, um, of these countries' uh, development. So it was um, definitely a struggle. And we saw, I've mentioned um, India, China and Brazil, these countries would continue to be at the forefront of the atmospheric politics that um, continued over the following decades. And the discussions that emerged um, in Stockholm really mapped out some of the um, some of the framing, I guess, that we would continue to see, particularly around managing air pollution and, and who was responsible when um, air pollution drifted beyond a state's borders. So trans transboundary air pollution was very much a concern of this time. Um, one of the, the sort of factors, I guess, that can, that led to holding this conference in the first place had been Scandinavian concerns about acid rain coming from Germany and from the United Kingdom. So this was kind of the background. They weren't thinking climate change um, in the same way that 
that we are thinking about it today. That was um, certainly a on the agenda, but not not of um, not of priority. And the among the the demands that the that the developing world made at the conference was that well, if we are to limit our pollution or to change our course of development, then we need financial support to do so. And we need the transfer of technical skills and expertise to to accelerate this process. So this becomes understood in terms of the concept of additionality, that in addition to existing aid, further support would be necessary to, to ensure that they could meet these goals. But I think what's also interesting about Stockholm is that it brings together what we would today describe as civil society, which I think is a bit of a um, oh, an opaque term because at this point in time, Stockholm attracted almost a um, an unofficial conference really um, beyond the government delegations whereby we saw representations from a whole range of um, representatives of, of different causes and interests. And one of the, the prominent movements that um, I was really, you know, struck by and, and interested in and I follow it in the book is the engagement of Indigenous peoples in the, in the conference and trying to um, navigate this um, United Nations uh framing I suppose and, and conference and to, to, to the way that Indigenous leaders from North America and um, from Northern Europe started to see that there was an opportunity here to um, to advance their own cause through um, concerns about the environment. So I think we see some key players and key um, strains, I guess, of the climate politics that that we know today really emerging in the early 1970s. Hmm. Really interesting to hear kind of how many of those things are still very much part of the conversation mm. um, and many of those kind of dynamics as well of sort of whose responsibility is it and um, sort of some amount of dividing line between developing countries and more developed ones. Though I think quite helpfully as we go further, you're going to complicate that for us so we don't <laughs> um, kind of fall into false binaries. Um, but I want to kind of talk about this idea of the different countries because Although so far we've moved from sort of the right after World War II to the 1970s, talking about changes in science, talking about changes in political debates, there's also at the same time been a massive change in who's at the table, right? The United Nations has hugely expanded over this period, and therefore many other international organizations have as well, if we're looking, for example, if, if we only look at decolonization, that's a big piece of it in and of itself. How did this expansion impact these kinds of debates? Can we go into that in a bit more detail? Absolutely. I think this is um, another aspect that we don't quite um, appreciate from our from our current um, viewpoint is the enormous changes that were underway in the in the decades after the end of the Second World War with the the demise of, of various empires and the rise of a number of new and independent states. And of course this process was influenced by um, Cold War rivalries and the different kinds of um, uh, ambitions and aspirations of these decolonizing countries and and their um, I suppose the ways in which they they sought to to develop. But what I found was interesting is perhaps uh, it might not be as surprising to other people, but certainly I was really interested to see how even even institutions like the World Meteorological Organization. Um, something that you would assume on the face of it was a rather um, politically bland or, or somewhat neutral um, body of um, scientific coordination was also shaped by what was going on um, through these processes of decolonisation. Um, what was one of the early parts of the um, story here with the... Um, emergence of, of, of newly independent countries was that many of these new states didn't have the infrastructures and systems to continue meteorological coverage, to, to continue the instrumental record. And so the, 
the WMO, as it's often known, becomes a a, a, a means of of transferring uh, technology, um, training, science to these to these newly developing um, countries, newly independent, I should say to ensure that that uh, global infrastructure for for coordinating meteorological information um, is sustained, is actually made possible. Um, And this is part of this um, continuation in some ways of this post-war meteorological optimism that over time, with enough investment, with enough training, with enough coordination, that... Um, the coverage of the Earth's land mass, if not the ocean, would um, be made possible through through this through this organisation. So it's quite remarkable to see this, um, uh, I suppose, flow on effect of um, what happens when these um, countries gain independence, and that it's actually um, concerns about monitoring the weather and being part of these institutions that it becomes so important, and and that the WMO becomes almost shaping their their form of government, um, which is quite remarkable. And then over time, um, not not surprisingly, uh, of course, Cold War tensions start to um, infuse the the various meetings and conferences that um, are held under the auspices of the WMO. And um, not surprisingly, again, Tensions really boil over when it comes to uh, discussing, say, the the impacts of of uh, the conflict in Indochina, and we see, uh, of course, uh, the the tensions um, and the the rivalries around the Soviet bloc and the United States play out um, at at these conferences that are held and and accusations that. Um, of course, the United States does not want um, aired in, in these sorts of forums, but, of course, these become opportunities for countries to, to air those grievances. And um, you see, as I, as I quote in the book, the, a, a Cuban delegate linking the, the um, warfare and conflict in Southeast Asia to the impact on meteorology and that this is, um, in fact, entirely contrary to the peaceful aims of the United Nations. So really using these um, opportunities to point out the the hypocrisy and the and the contradictions that um, are going on even even in science, even in this moment of um, collaboration and coordination. Um, this is it's not all it's cracked up to be. So there's there's a whole array of issues that are emerging um, as a result of decolonization, and one of the issues, I guess, that is um, sort of continues throughout the 1970s is a desire for a new international economic order, and that really starts to um, shape the the debates well into the 1980s and beyond. A sense that the developing countries are no longer um, satisfied or prepared to uh, tolerate the inequities of um, the international economic and political systems in which they um, understand themselves to uh, be, well, certainly getting the, the, um, the, raw, the raw end of the stick um, and they, they want to see these um, inequities rebalanced and and this becomes an ongoing issue um, throughout the United Nations and we continue to see that today. We very much continue to see that today so thank you for um, kind of going a bit further into that aspect (laughs) of sort of who's at the table uh, and what are the debates and especially I think that link to the global economic system again going back to the point we've made that climate things are not in isolation. um, That's right. These debates are very much linked. Um, can we continue our trend, please, of complicating the story? Can we add in forests? When, how, with what impact do they get added to these discussions? That's right. That's we we do, I suppose, um, forget sometimes that. Um, I mean, I suppose when we we talk about climate change, we often see forests as a way to slow down climate change, to uh, perhaps even 
fix the problem entirely because, um, as we know, trees are very important to the to the global carbon cycle and, and they can absorb carbon dioxide. And, and we understandably are very concerned about deforestation and what that um, would mean not only for the biodiversity of those places, but what it would mean from the perspective of um, greenhouse gas emissions and, and mitigation. But if we look back in time, um, in fact, forests and climates have a a long and um, interesting relationship. Certainly, um, well, I won't go way back, but even during the colonial period of the 1800s and, and, uh, and perhaps even earlier, an awareness of the local impacts of deforestation on on local conditions, on stream flow, on desertification, on soils. So a real awareness that forests did have an important role to play and that they ought to be conserved. Now, I've mentioned acid rain and, and the concerns around transboundary air pollution and the impact of, of um that uh, problem on forests in northern Europe as being a, a contributor contributing issue to um, the urgency and interest in in holding the 1972 Stockholm conference but scientifically what's going on in the background is an awareness that well forests are part of the natural carbon cycle this is something that's only being mapped out really in um, the 1940s and 1950s and by the late 1970s there becomes a real concern that deforestation is an additional source of carbon dioxide, that they weren't absorbing the carbon dioxide as scientists had hoped, um, but rather they were being, as they were being cut down, they were adding to um, the atmospheric accumulation of, of carbon dioxide. So becoming a real problem. And, and this is emerging, interestingly, and perhaps um, not coincidentally, at the same time as growing concern about um the world's tropical forests. This is when we start to see a lot of concern, not only about um, industrialization and development projects happening in the Amazon, often funded by the World Bank and European countries, but also about the the indigenous peoples that live in those forests and, and the impacts of these um, uh, enormous projects on, on their life ways and livelihoods. So this is a, um, an interesting intersection of um, concern about deforestation for the, for the impacts at that local level from a, something of a humanitarian um, level, but also what it meant for, for the planet because of this understanding of a global carbon cycle. Now, this is where as you might have um, already gathered, tensions and issues start to emerge because while the forests might have um, a role to play in, in global or planetary processes, forests grow on land in particular nation states. So you, you start to see issues of sovereignty and development start to emerge. So very quickly, when these scientific concerns about deforestation um, emerge, mainly in the, in the United States at first, um, it is perceived by developing countries like Brazil that this is some kind of um, intervention in into their own affairs, into Brazil's affairs, and um, it ought to be um, not so much ignored, but actively rejected, that this was um, an incursion on, on their development. Um, and this is an issue that we see play out throughout um, climate negotiations um, into, into the 1990s and beyond because of the tension between uh, atmospheric change at that planetary level and where these emissions and what's called a carbon sink are based. And they are within nation states. So it's absolutely um, a question of how governments can reconcile these, these tensions, these, these contradictions even between the decisions that are happening within the nation state and the implications at that planetary level. So forests became a really interesting um, issue to, to explore um, and how that changed over time. And 
another sort of aspect of this issue of, of forestry is that the concerns around deforestation in um, of the world's tropical forests was was also um, complicated by the fact that in the old world per se or the developed world, much of their forests had already been cleared. So again, developing countries like Brazil, um, like Indonesia, could turn around to the industrialized world and say, well, hang on, you've you've used your sources of uh, you've used your forests um you can't tell us how to use ours um because of the implications for their development so these issues become very much wrapped up in the kinds of approaches and um solutions for want of a better word that are available to deal with um this this global problem can we talk a bit about where these debates are happening um or I mean, I suppose where makes it sound like I mean kind of a building and I don't quite mean literally a building. Um, But I do kind of mean, I guess, the fora in which all of these discussions are being held. We briefly mentioned sort of the idea of kind of particular conferences being key. How did the UN and the IPCC become the sort of key institutions where all of this is being discussed and debated? That's a really good point. Um, and these are now very well established. Uh, the obviously the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change um, is founded in 1988 as a uh, joint initiative, really, of the World Meteorological Organization and um, the UN Environment Program, which is a um, product, really, um, of the Stockholm Conference from 1972, and it's the first UN agency to be established in um, a developing country country in um, Kenya. And that was not without um, uh, contestation as well, of course. Um, so we have the, the IPCC established to be basically a, a, a means for governments. It's a, it's a governmental body that's important to remember uh, to negotiate the science of climate change, to clarify um, the the science, scientific understandings to work out uh, degrees of um, of uncertainty, to to work out really what's going on, and to come to some kind of consensus, um, and, and that does become something of a of a challenge for for this institution, not least because of um, governmental involvement. The other agencies that are involved in terms of the institutions of climate change are the UN General Assembly itself. And that perhaps is a surprising forum for for us, but I think it it reflects the fact that climate change, as we've we've, um, stated already, is not happening outside anything. It's not happening outside uh, geopolitics or, or the political affairs that concern the United Nations more generally. So it comes out of the United Nations General Assembly that indeed it it is a, such a, a matter of such great importance that um, every country has a stake in this planetary phenomenon. And so out of this agreement in the late 1980s, we embark on um, a series of um, of meetings to form what becomes the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change in 1992. And so, this is a um, a body that, as I say, involves all the the nations that are represented at the United Nations plus observers as well, and so. This is how, I suppose, we see the the climate regime emerge at the end of the Cold War, where we have a scientific body, albeit one with government oversight, and a a policy-focused body emerge, which also is um, constituted mostly by government representatives. But interestingly, there is space at the table for uh, those that seek to um, advance or perhaps push forward climate action um, and and the 
negotiation of a wider array of issues that can be seen through a climate lens, but there are there is also the opportunity for those that want to stall that action. And that is a curious um, element, I suppose, that that is there from the outset that we have both um, the champions, I suppose, of climate action and and the laggards or those that deliberately want to to slow down um, and any any policy making on these issues. Um, and to see all of those groups represented um, is quite fascinating and, and peculiar and I suppose really defines the, the rather, I suppose, strange and, and interesting um, negotiations that follow because once the, the Framework Convention is signed um, at the Rio conference in 1992, the, um, the parties of the Framework Convention begin to meet annually. These are the COPs that we now um, hear so much about when they when the um, delegations meet and they're they're quite um, you know large uh, get-togethers and um, some are more momentous than others. But they start to meet every year from 1995, and um, they are the ones that then come up with uh, the d- d- defining um, uh, arrangements, really, of, of governing climate change. The Kyoto Protocol, of course, the Paris Agreement, this, this emerges from, from the Framework Convention. So, in fact, can we talk about the Kyoto Protocol, um, given sort of if we're in the mid-90s at this point, um, the combination of the sort of laggards and champions? The Kyoto Protocol is, I think, fair enough to say is kind of one of the most famous elements of this new uh, system being created. You talk about in the book that in many ways, um, at, both at the time and I think very much since then, it's considered sort of a watered down a- attempt or agreement, I suppose, on these issues. What were some of the key ways that it kind of ended up in this position? Um, what does it have to do, for example, with the champions versus laggards setup that you just gave us? Well, I think it's um, quite quite tragic in some ways that um, the Kyoto Protocol has was was somewhat hobbled from the outset. There were great ambitions for, for what this held, um, particularly I think in the mid-90s before there was this recognition that in fact domestic politics would have a lot to to contribute, I suppose, to the shaping of, of an international regime that the participating governments had to go back to their home countries and make the case for for the arrangements that were being agreed to. Now, with the Kyoto Protocol, we see these negotiations unfold from about 1995. This is 1995, we see the first conference of the parties in Berlin and a recognition already that Oh, this is going to be a lot harder than we thought. We're we're asking our um, uh, our, our citizens, our governments, our economies to to undertake some pretty significant changes to reduce emissions by certain levels um, to to bring about a reduction overall of of greenhouse gas emissions. So this was going to be very difficult, and we saw um, that there were some parts of the world who were more ambitious, particularly in um, the countries of Western Europe, um, and then countries led by the United States. And, um, of course, I shouldn't leave out uh, the, the OPEC nations, um, although they're in a slightly different um, category because they were classed as developing countries. So there were different expectations um, that emerged around who would be reducing their emissions. And this we can see the, the the precursor, I suppose, for, for this line of thought by going back to the Stockholm Conference, that there would be certain responsibilities that developed countries um, would undertake because they had had the, the privilege to um, uh, industrialise first and to achieve greater wealth and that then at some later point, developing countries, once they had achieved um, some degree of development, they too might then be expected to to contribute. But 
as the negotiations unfolded and uh, politics in the United States took a turn that was rather unfavourable towards signing an agreement that would allow um, the Clinton administration to sign up to any um, agreement that would um, affect the US economy, it meant that the Kyoto Protocol would have to take a rather different shape. It would have to, um, because... I should add the the one of the caveats of these politics emerging in the United States was um, the Bird Hegel resolution, and this was not only concerned with ensuring that the U.S. didn't sign um, a agreement that would affect its economy, that it would not sign an agreement that didn't have the involvement or assent of developing countries. So this was. A, a really big problem, really, for for achieving the kind of overall emissions reductions that that had they had hoped to achieve. Because at this time, the US is one of, if not the biggest, one of the one of the biggest emitters, and they definitely needed to be within the tent and reducing their um, their emissions. So there was a lot of compromise um, involved to ensure that the US would sign on and would be involved. And as we know, um, the Bush administration would eventually not sign up to the Kyoto Protocol, but nevertheless the United States shaped the key mechanisms of the protocol um, around market mechanisms. And this is probably not all that surprising. This is really the heyday um, of um, uh, what's called... uh, liberal environmentalism this kind of idea that after the um in the after the end of the cold war in the early 1990s that well obviously um market uh market economies were more um effective uh stronger and so on they had uh, been shown to be um, better in all ways after the collapse of the Soviet Union. So why not apply these same mechanisms to ensure that um, greenhouse gas emissions could be reduced? Now, one of the key um, mechanisms that emerges, and it's crafted between um, the United States and Brazil, surprisingly, is to develop what was the clean development mechanism, a means for developing countries, even if they weren't reducing their own emissions, to be um, incorporated into an international market system of um, basically offsetting uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the developed countries by um, turning to uh, supporting sustainable development programs in the South. So that was one of the the key mechanisms that emerged that had a lot of um, critique and I think still would have a lot of um, concerns about, well, this is really a way for developed countries perhaps to... um, avoid their their responsibilities, their avoid being accountable. And what's also important to note was some of the interesting accounting that um, was uh, employed to work out how uh, emission reductions would be achieved. Every country had their own particular emission reduction that they were expected to achieve. So um, I've just looked at my notes here. The US was supposed to reduce theirs by 7% from 1990 levels, Canada 6%. Um, These numbers were a little bit arbitrary. It wasn't entirely clear how um, they were arrived at. And my own country, Australia, was perhaps um, one of the more curious cases. Australia was actually allowed to emit more emissions relative to 1990 because of their, um, well, perhaps clever negotiators if we want to be generous, but also because of the desire for um, consensus agreement to be reached. There there was compromise to try and ensure that all countries would sign up to this agreement. Now, at the end of the day, um, we see that, of course, the US doesn't sign up to the Kyoto Protocol, despite playing such a fundamental role in shaping its um, design and Australia follows the United States by not signing the Kyoto Protocol for, for, for some time, not until um, 
2007, actually. Um, but because of this need to have a certain um, percentage of emissions being covered by the um, uh, Kyoto Protocol, before that can come into action, it although it's signed in 1997, um, it doesn't come into force until, 2000, until, until 2005, which, you know, that's quite a significant delay um, and, and really points to some of the um, the difficulties of of trying to to reach these kinds of of agreements and in the meantime um, we have countries like China undergoing enormous growth and entering the world trade organizations and yet China is not included um, in the list of countries the developed countries that are expected to reduce their emissions so this is where um, it's a bit of a strange, arrangement because that list of countries that are um, the ones that are expected to reduce their emissions, that's based on their, I suppose, socioeconomic circumstances as of 1992. That's a lot that changes between 1992 and 2005 when, when the Kyoto Protocol actually comes into force. And I think that's a very good summary of why it had so much criticism at the time and why it still continues to be seen as um, a missed opportunity, I suppose, is the most optimistic way to put it. Yes, I think that's I think that's a good term for it. I'm not really sure how, obviously, you know, um, as a historian, we're not very good at counterfactuals or the, the what if something had turned out differently. Certainly, um, the, um, they were in a very difficult position, not only with the domestic politics in the United States, but also with the um, developing countries grouped together as the group of 77 plus China, that they were very adamant that, um, well, the bigger developing countries were adamant that they were not, uh, they had not been responsible for these emissions and they should not have to curb their development. The only developing countries that were pushing for much more ambitious um, uh, outcomes or a more ambitious protocol were, and we shouldn't be surprised, were the small island developing states, countries Mm -hmm. in the Pacific, countries in the Indian Ocean and the Caribbean, who really understood from the outset that this was a uh, an existential um, problem for them, and they they have been basically at the forefront of of um, climate negotiations, try, trying to drag other countries with them from a from basically a very moral perspective. That um, time and time again, standing up and saying this. If, if these emissions are allowed to continue, this could mean the death of our nation. And they, they mm-hmm. return to this um, uh, very confronting and, and emotional framing um, because that is how, that, that's the stakes for their countries. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's very much continuing today. Um, And there's cases at the international court level um, on this topic as well that are underway sort of as we speak. So I suppose that kind of gives me a good, platform to ask kind of what you're telling us about 2005 and sort of where we're at then what sorts of alliances or kind of different countries and different groups or different actors and different groups to what extent is that still kind of the same today as it was 20 years ago obviously the small island aspect of it is very there's a lot of continuity there but is there anything that sort of shifted since then that you think is particularly significant well, I think um, it's really the shifts that we've seen, we've seen um, in the lead up to the the Copenhagen conference, which admittedly was um, not the the crowning moment that many hoped it might be, um, but then further towards the the lead up to Paris and what was seen as well I think mixed feelings um I, th- I suppose that the proof will be in the pudding there but the the changing circumstances for countries like China and uh, India became very apparent um particularly at Copenhagen where it's Brazil the BRICS nations um at in center stage really um with the negotiation of um, a very unusual agreement at Copenhagen. We had China, India, uh, Brazil and the United States, South Africa involved in trying to to work out what 
a new agreement would look like, what the successor to, to the Kyoto Protocol would look like. And that was quite remarkable. And what was interesting to to explore a little further was how China is China and India, um, again, sh- demonstrating how climate politics is not somehow separate from the rest of the world, that they very much are understanding the um, climate regime as part of their broader and amb- geopolitical ambitions and their broader development ambitions. So taking China, for example, the the concerns at the government level about the implications for their legitimacy arising from terrible air pollution in in Chinese cities, arising from from rapid industrialization, they see very clearly the the need to to change their reliance on um, on polluting sources of energy to, and and needing renewable sources of energy to sustain their development and to sustain their their hold on power. Um, And the clean development mechanism that I mentioned earlier as one of these Kyoto instruments was really important for China to actually gain access to that technology um, that they needed to start to transition away from um, coal and, and um, these dirtier technologies. They, they needed that access and they wouldn't have perhaps been able to access it as quickly and as affordably as they were able to do um, through this Kyoto mechanism. India has um, been really keen to show its international leadership. Um, They are very keen to have a seat at the Security Council, very keen to be um, a a global leader. And so climate um, policy has been an important way for um, Indian governments to demonstrate that um, they are a legitimate player and they've been heavily investing in solar technology as well, again, through this clean development mechanism, which has enabled um, them to adopt these kinds of technologies. Now, it's not to say that India and China are suddenly going to um, slash their emissions enormously, but when you look at the scale of of, um, uh, development underway in these um, places, the size of the populations and so on, these these do represent very significant changes, I guess, to the kinds of um, stalling and um, really uh, difficult negotiations that were underway in the 1990s, particularly around the Kyoto Protocol. So their role changed um, quite significantly. What's also been interesting has been um, the US and the Yes, it's waxed and waned with um, the Trump administration, and it will be interesting to see how this plays out. But the US has pushed um, with the Pacific Islands and Europe under a high ambition coalition to try and get this um, what came up came out to be the Paris Agreement, the the two degrees and ideally the one and a half degrees um, of limiting dangerous climate change. So that was another sort of interesting. Um, uh, conf- reconfiguration of alliances, and of course, I'm I'm not um, so naive to to say that the US, um, you know, is is somehow um, pure of heart and um, uh, not not without its um, issues with its approach to to climate change, but. It certainly in the negotiations um, played a key role in bringing different um, uh, these different countries together, and and Europe too has has remained very much on the side of the more ambitious um, targets throughout. So I think that's been quite interesting. And then we see, of course, the the OPEC nations still. Um, I suppose, holding their ground, seeing that, of course, these negotiations are a real threat to their economies and trying, of course, to make sure that, um, well, either water down the commitments or to um, ensure that they have some kind of, um, what's the word, some kind of um, trade-off that will uh, lessen the impact on their own economies. Mm. 
given where we started off um, talking about optimism after atomic bombs being <laughs> really not something we necessarily expect, um, you've brought us all the way up to the present, uh, and it now sounds very familiar, but with understanding of how we actually got here, which is incredibly helpful. So I think very usefully now, listeners can kind of, next time there is one of these big cops, um, look ahead and understand kind of who's allied with whom and who's trying to do what and and why and, and how we ended up in this place. So I guess that leaves me only to ask, um, obviously, I'm not going to ask you, like, what is the future of climate negotiations? Because uh, I don't God, think anyone can you. answer that. <laughs> I'm um, very but glad now, to we know, hear. now at least we know what to look for. So that's helpful. Um, but hopefully a question you can answer. What are you working on now that this book is done and out there? Well, I, I wait with bated breath to to see how um, this book is received. And, um, of course, we could always think of things that we should have included if only we could. Um, but what I suppose um, I'm interested in developing um, in terms of a new project brings some of the themes of this book together with some of my ongoing um, interests in um climate and water histories in Australia. And I'm very interested in exploring uh, what was a post-Second World War program called the UNESCO Arid Zone Program. And I have come to realise that Australian scientists played a outsized role in this program's development and um, implementation and saw them uh, making quite a few interventions in um, Egypt and India and um, various arid parts of the world. And I'm curious to see, well, what does that mean for what is being um, transferred in terms of science, technology and ideas about development to to, um, places outside Australia? And what are those scientists bringing back? So there's all sorts of interesting um, political and environmental exchanges that I'm keen to explore there so I'm keeping that international lens and um but hoping to perhaps um uh narrow my focus somewhat to to see what is happening on the ground and and how are some of these programs being resisted because that was certainly hard to get down to the local um level in in this sort of bigger history of climate change yeah, no, I can absolutely understand that. Um, but this new project sounds fascinating. So hopefully it becomes a book and we can have you back. Um, but in the meantime, of course, listeners can read it. It's titled Climate Change and International History, Negotiating Science, Global Change and Environmental Justice, and just out in early 2024 from Bloomsbury. Ruth, thank you so much for being with us on the podcast. Thank you, Miranda. I've really enjoyed myself. Thank you. Thank you.